Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And of course, you are with us in this very beautiful Thursday morning. It's not Friday yet; it's just Thursday. It's not just one more day to go. <laughs> one more day to go, and we are yeah, as usual every morning we will discuss about news from Southeast Asia or concern this region. So the first one is something that I would have no uh, known. That it will happen one day, but mm-hmm. I, I'm glad that uh, investigation is underway. This is regarding on the FIFA alleged corruption probe, uh, targe- uh, which targets the World Cup of fraud, uh, according to IRS chief. And I think this is one of the reasons why I've kind of always been against the World Cup and never really looking forward to it, uh, as much as there's. All these people say there's the team spirit and you're playing for a country, so it's different. The feeling, you know, it's it's a lot more genuine when you play for a country as opposed to playing for the club. Yeah, that's my but opinion. I always <laughs> feel like FIFA is a lot more has a lot more problems than uh, the leagues themselves, mm-hmm. and I think this is a perfect uh, example here. Uh, and even the fact that the next World Cup is going to be uh, held in Qatar in uh, 2022, that's Uh, drawing a huge yes, outreach so as well Cups. next to World Cups, yeah, yeah. and uh, it will violate a lot of human rights issues. And they have estimated that at least 1,000 people will die, but uh, they still want to go ahead with it because it's uh, mm-hmm. such a proud thing for them to host the World Cup. You know, it's funny because I think a lot of uh, comedians, uh, mm-hmm. politicians, and people have been raising about the issue of corruption in FIFA. I think oh, even for all of us, I agree with you. Your mm-hmm. concern about World Cup and FIFA misconduct, supposed misconduct in uh, in ensuring World Cup to be more transparent and not be. And not being shrouded by controversy, but unfortunately it is. But finally, something has been done, and the U.S. Justice Department unsealed a 47 count indictment in federal court in Brooklyn that detailed charges against 14 people accused of racketeering, a uh, wired fraud, and mon- money laundering conspiracy. That's a huge mm. international conspiracy. Yeah, I and I totally agree with you. We kind of know that these things have been happening uh, within FIFA, and a lot of people have been sort of speculating. But this is. Uh, finally, the time when they finally took some actions mm-hmm. and uh, proved that these things are in fact going on in FIFA, and uh, something has to be done about it. Because at the end of the day, FIFA World Cup is about football, and mm-hmm. it's uh, not so much about uh, big companies trying to make more money. But it's so sad that it has. Uh, taken a diversion and headed into that direction now. I think there are some people who actually see FIFA as a quote unquote mafia organization, mm-hmm. but according to the U.S. Attorney General Ro- Loretta Lynch, uh, she actually mentioned that the most serious of the racketeering charges, which alleged that the officials are uh, has been turning soccer or in this case football mm-hmm. uh, into a criminal enterprise. So I'm not surprised. <laughs> exactly. Uh, like I was saying earlier, that it has taken that diversion, and instead of being more uh, sport oriented, uh, it has become more about uh, how to make more money and and how to uh, gain more benefits from this in terms of wealth creation, even or in terms of uh, exerting their influence based on their status. But it's really sad because mm. World Cup is the only time where people come together and. Try Try to do away racism, mm-hmm. war, and all the other uh, things that would divide society, and and it's the only time where people compete with each other based on uh, sports and not based on uh, a military might or things that would kill other or would hurt other people. Mm-hmm. So I am. 
I I hope that you know FIFA in the future will be a more cleaner FIFA. And then you mentioned uh, uh, earlier on about how FIFA has been uh, closing one eye on human rights violations, yeah. especially in Qatar. And apparently in Russia, which will be the next yeah. FIFA, uh, they would be using guess what prisoners. I'm saying prisoners okay. to build the stadiums and all that. And I think this is wrong as well, as much as mm. some people would say that, oh, you know, you have uh, free labor there and they're not doing anything. Might mm-hmm. as well use them to build, uh, to construct the World Cup stadium. But I don't mm. think it's um, it, it is the right thing to do. I think we they, they have lesser rights in terms of labor rights than the normal citizens and and I think it's a huge violation mm-hmm. of human rights. I think you're right. I actually I would probably be one of those people who think that uh, instead of sitting around in prison, they might as well do something productive. Mm-hmm. But then again, uh, like you were saying, will their rights be protected as yeah. uh, the 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 normal workers? They, they and would probably be in the, on the same level mm-hmm. as those uh, foreign uh, immigrants. And uh, if something happens to them or if they are injured or died, they will probably just be ignored or, or brushed off and not be given the same importance. And because of so- social stigmati- stigmatization mm. towards criminals, they would be seen as, oh, it's worth it you know, for them to die like that because <laughs> mm-hmm. they did a lot of crime in the past. But I don't think we should have that an eye for an eye sort of mentality. And it seems that the next step uh, that will take place uh, is where the federal officials will bring all these suspects to the United States uh, to face all these allegations and uh, we'll see what's going to happen to these 11 individuals who are arrested. You see, uh, as much as the US is condemned throughout the world for mm. you know, creating wars, starting wars, but I do feel that in this case, the US... Uh, does have a moral authority in in trying to straighten out FIFA and, and I think you need a bigger asshole to straighten out mm-hmm. <laughs> FIFA oh yeah <laughs> well I mean uh, a lot of football experts as well uh, have mm-hmm. tweeted and uh, supported uh, the US uh, and applauding them for actually uh, stepping up and uh, doing something about uh, the issues in FIFA because uh, it has been ongoing for a while, and if that's if there's one country that can do something about this, it's actually uh, the U.S. That's true. They, they still hold that uh, global moral authority mm-hmm. in a way, in a way. So from FIFA, we move on to another news. Uh, this one is more localized. So Gary, yeah, finally, your <laughs> chief minister is doing something. I'm so happy. I you. knew you were going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> because you love to, you know, promote your Penang. So I'm just trying to provide a platform. Of course, Penang is the <laughs> best Penang. place to be. <laughs> so tell me more about what is happening right now in Penang. So what happened was uh, our chief minister, uh, Lim Guan Eng, has uh, unveiled... Chief my chief minister. <laughs> Mine is a different one. That's right. Yours will be Azmin Ali. Huh? Yeah. So he has uh, unveiled a shadow cabinet. And what's interesting about this is it's not a PKR shadow cabinet, mm-hmm. but more of a DAP shadow cabinet. And they're saying that uh, there is uh, a lot of issues going on with PKR at the moment and they cannot reach a consensus and come up with a collective shadow cabinet. So DAP just went ahead and unveiled their own. Mm-hmm. So apparently uh, uh, the, the, the remark came up a day after the newly installed opposition leader, Datuk Sri Dr. Wan Aziza Wan Ismet Mail, that proposed that PR revisits its previous plan mm. to form a shadow cabinet. I guess DAP can't wait too long because whenever you make a promise, usually mm-hmm. it comes with um, no action. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I guess uh, they just want to get it out there to show that something is uh, progressing uh, within uh, the op- the opposition. But I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic mm. with the line of, uh, I would say, um, minister, minister portfolio mm-hmm. that they have assigned to. For example, under the DAP's proposed shadow cabinet, Tony Pua will lead the finance and economic portfolio. Gobin Singh Dio will head the home and law portfolio, while Dr. On Kian Ming will lead the health and environment portfolio, while Zairil Kher Johari, he will lead the education, science and technology. But you know, my criticism is, where's the woman? Where's the woman? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, uh, I, I guess it's probably not the complete uh, cabinet uh, that we have uh, mm-hmm. listed here. But uh, uh, actually, to look at it, uh, I'm quite optimistic as well, mm-hmm. especially seeing that Tony Poa is the... Uh, who will be leading the finance and in mm. economy portfolio because he h- has been the most vocal one about 1MDB, mm. about trying to bring it to the masses, uh, especially because I follow him on Twitter. He tries really, really hard to break down 1MDB and every other scandal that the government has to the masses, trying so hard to make them understand and understand what's happening with the country. But then that should be the portfolio of home ministry, isn't it? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I I'm I hope that uh, with this shadow cabinet, we will have a more balanced opinions and balanced view when it comes to who is doing their job or who has the better policy, who uh, who has the better mm-hmm. argument uh, that can uh, influence public uh, opinions. But as, at the same time, uh, I would love to look at the whole uh, list of portfolios, mm-hmm. and hopefully, there is a balance of women. And and uh, male, um, uh, ma- female and female MPs. But at the same time, I hope that mm. the female MPs are not being given the usual portfolios, you know, women and development. Right. <laughs> it's time to f- time for them to branch out as well because, yeah. of course, they are also capable of handling other portfolios. Yeah. But another interesting thing uh, that uh, should be highlighted here is that they have made it ca- compulsory that mm-hmm. Each minister cannot hold more than one portfolio. Oh, that's and amazing. I think, yeah, that's amazing because that is the issue that we're facing at the moment uh, with the, the current uh, ruling yeah, government. The Prime Minister is holding, mm-hmm. I think, a few portfolios. At, at least three, I yeah, think. Yeah, at least three. <laughs> and, uh, yes, there's been a lot of criticism about that. The, why can't you just handle one? And, I mean, being the Prime Minister itself is probably a tough enough job and you don't need to have three other uh, portfolios under you. And finance and all, which adds uh, more burden, and sure. probably it's hard for them to just focus on one thing and uh, develop that, and uh, ha- so the people can benefit from it. So anyway, Gauri, we'll take one short break. When we return, we'll talk about an issue that is <laughs> gripping the whole of Southeast Asian nation, especially Malaysia. This is regarding on the Rohingya uh, mass grave. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Hello, this is Gauri. And of course, you are with us again on ASEAN Daily. So, when it comes to uh, horrible human rights violation right now, this, the focus is on Malaysia, especially when uh, we, uh, I mean, Malaysia has been one of the places where mass graves of um, of uh, refugees and economic migrants has been found in the region of in, in the border of Malaysia and Thailand, and apparently the camp was found in January. That's quite a few months ago, isn't it? Yes, uh, of course, that would be about five months ago. And there's been uh, various uh, opinions and circulations coming in saying that how can we not realize something that's been there all along? And we're not just talking about one or two. This is uh, in the numbers 140 of... 140 so far. Yeah, exactly. And... Uh, a few officials uh, have been interviewed and some of them are saying that it was actually found all the way in January but it was uh, just uh, being uh, concealed. Uh, Probably they uh, were having some uh, private investigations uh, and whatnot. Uh, but uh, he also said that he was unsure why the matter is only being made public now after all this time. And the worst part is when journalists interview the locals uh, around the area of Perlis, they said that they have knew about this quite some time ago, uh, in fact, a couple years back, of years back, and and there have been uh, sightings of uh, ill Rohingya and Bangladeshi mm. asking for food food and water and and some of them would be asking for shelter and clothing and some of them the authority actually knew about this their situation and and the, the but no, no action has been done which is mm-hmm. the question of why um and, and, and just recently that uh, police have been nabbing a, uh, a number of police officers who believe to be uh, maybe a complicit 
in this human trafficking case. Mm. And uh, what uh, Evan Sider is the official who was interviewed said that uh, no Malaysians were found uh, there, and uh, all all the other uh, bodies that were uh, ex- excavated actually looked weak and starving. So. Uh, I guess that validates uh, the story f- of the people in Perlis as well on yeah. when they uh, were going around just looking for food uh, and, and they looked weak and sick and they just needed some help at that mm. point and nothing was uh, done at that at that uh, point of time to address it. I, I feel very angry at the Malaysian authority right now because I feel that we, I mean there's a Nazi camp that mm. is you know, operating or had been operating in our backyard and nothing has been done to address this. And and this is not just a Malaysia issue, it's a transnational or, mm-hmm. or a regional issue. We can no longer uh, say that the non-interference policy would not uh, affect the Malaysian citizen. In fact, what we are seeing right now, because of that particular clause within ASEAN Charter, it has mm. affected our reputation tremendously. At the end of the day, we are just spitting on our face. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think you're not the only one who's angry about Malaysia. Probably the whole world uh, mm-hmm. is uh, speaking out uh, against Malaysia at this point of time because it's uh, it, it is uh, they even call it a camp, like you were saying earlier. Okay. Yeah, and uh, this exhum process was uh, it took so much time because of the hundreds of bodies there, mm-hmm. and it seems that. Uh, about 100 meters from the camp, the police are also tr- starting to dig out other parts to see if they can find more bodies and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's really shameful that this has to also happen now when we are the chair uh, of ASEAN. And uh, it, it's really not reflecting well on Malaysia or how it's supposed to lead, by example, first with the Rohingya boat people and now uh, with this issue, which mm-hmm. is... Uh, a terrible, terrible human rights problem that is happening at our very own backyard. That's true. And and it's not just affecting Malaysia, but it's definitely affecting Aung San Suu Kyi, who was once hailed as the lady, uh, the, uh, the lady that... Plum, uh, shining the the light of mm. democracy in Myanmar. But now, sh- uh, her reputation is so bad that... Uh, the upcoming human rights uh, gathering in Oslo, Norway, will not mm. include her, but will include other Nobel laureates. Um, partly because uh, the, the the main focus of that gathering would be on the Rohingya issue and human trafficking. Partly, partly she wasn't invited because mm. she has been silenced. She hasn't been using the word Rohingya at all, and and. The fact that she see herself more as a polish politician nowadays rather mm. than a human rights defender. But it's more it's a a very political thing, don't you think? She's probably she, uh she wants to participate in the elections and she wants to uh win it as well. And we know that the people in uh, Myanmar uh don't really like or are not really happy with the term Rohingya as well and they don't want these people to be recognized. So if she actually uh speak up and uh do something for the Rohingyas, which by right she should, but she's not doing it because she doesn't want to uh lose the support of, of the people in Myanmar who would probably be like Okay, whatever. We're not voting mm. for you anymore. But then it comes back to mm. her role. Is she yeah. a politician for a certain segment of exactly. uh, Myanmar uh, society, or she's uh, she representing the whole of Myanmar community, mm. which would include the Rohingyas? And it goes back to human rights as well. Uh, if she is a politician, as she says, that doesn't mean that she just neglects the human rights issue. It's in the country, because mm. at the end of the day, that probably carries more weight mm. than whatever else that she's planning to do. And if she's not even invited uh, uh, to the uh, conference, and that shows that people are already starting to have a bad impression about her and her motives. And it's not just the global, uh, even mm. within ASEAN, rights group uh, is speaking up against Aung San Suu Kyi for not uh, doing anything mm-hmm. on the Rohingya issue. So the New York-based Human Rights Watch uh, urged Myanmar opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi to break her silence on the humanitarian crisis. And I think if she really cares about her political mm. future, she has to say something. Because as much as she wants to win the heart and minds of the Myanmar people, she needs to win the hearts and minds of the global world. 
people won't respect her in the future. Mm-hmm. I think you're absolutely right, and she probably has uh, a not a not a very good advisor at the moment who uh, probably told her that this is uh, what she has to do and what she has to say in in order to still have the support of the people. But at the same time, if you look at the bigger picture, mm-hmm. it's a lot more worse for her political future if she remains silent yeah. than if she actually speaks out. I mean, in such a way, she was under house arrest for decades. But if this is how she would end it up as a mm-hmm. legacy. It would be such a waste. And uh, I mean, even then, uh, like you were saying, this is a human rights thing. It's a humanitarian issue. And yeah. for her to say that uh, she's more of a politician uh I think it really doesn't make sense and it's also uh, will probably go back on her as well and, and uh, jeopardize her own future. So besides Aung San Suu Kyi, criticism has been pouring over ASEAN mm-hmm. and I would... Not surprised. Uh, uh, that would add <laughs> to my own criticism against mm-hmm. ASEAN too. I think if there's a way for people to respect ASEAN as a regional grouping. This would be the time for ASEAN to take charge and do something against Myanmar because I think Myanmar has been the bad boy Mm -hmm. (laughs) in ASEAN in a way that they try to uh, threaten ASEAN to not uh, go to that, uh, to not attend the human trafficking summit and Mm -hmm. they, they they were obviously threatening ASEAN for, you know, don't ever use the word Rohingya at all in mm. any of the ASEAN summit. And I think it's it, ASEAN should hold its moral leadership against Myanmar. And yeah, that's another thing uh, about ASEAN that uh, we we tend to be so uh, forgiving and compromising. And like, okay, if Myanmar doesn't want to use the term Rohingya, we will not bring it up. Mm. And uh, of course, it's probably uh, for the diplomatic reasons trying to uh, maintain the relationship that we have with all the countries but it comes back to bite us like what happened with the boat people what happened what's happening here with the Rohingyas at the end of the day we we are somehow involved because it's in this region and there's no running away from it Mm -hmm. and in fact uh, Malaysia Indonesia and Thailand somehow changed their mind about the Muslim Rohingya refugees especially when uh, they face heavy global condemnation for refusing to accept them. And I think the the global community con- should continue, you know, with the mm-hmm. criticism because mm-hmm. sometimes when you are up there as a leader, you fail to see what is happening down there and until mm-hmm. the the global society condemns you and then you realize that hey if I still want to have a career as a politician I need to do something <laughs> but not because it's a humanitarian issue mm. but because they want to save their asses right but yeah I mean looking at this it took us three weeks to actually do something about uh, the the boat people about the refugee issues and it really sets a very bad example once again for Malaysia as the chair of ASEAN that we were not able to step up and uh, lead by example for all the other countries. In fact, I think it was Philippines that was the country that that was uh, proactive uh, uh, to actually do something. Mm -hmm. Which we thought that they are (laughs) in their own world. (laughs) They are in their own world (laughs) with their Shari Alo. But it it, it turns out that the people of Aceh Mm -hmm. have more hearts than mine. Uh, We will take another one short break. But when we return, we will discuss more on other areas in Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies, first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And of course, you are with us again on ASEAN Daily. So Gauri, guess who is setting up an NGO? Uh, is it our big brother China? <laughs> yes, they are setting it up with ASEAN. <laughs> That's interesting for China to actually come up. I would say I'm a little surprised. I, I would be extremely surprised. Because I always thought that China do not like the civil society. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, according to the news that Shi Guohui, Deputy General, Secretary General of the Chinese China NGO Network for International Exchanges, the co-sponsor of the event, said that the second biennial talks were expected to agree on the formation of an NGO network that will help maintain mutual understanding and cooperations between civil society groups from the two regions. So 
So uh, why exactly is China uh, stepping up and forming this network with ASEAN and trying to promote more understanding, uh, trying to promote the sharing of information? Because, uh, well, maybe I'm a little old-fashioned here, but I always thought that China was the one that's holding back information uh, <laughs> from the people and only telling them, what they think the people should know. This should is the hear. official answer. Apparently, that there's a need for a permanent mechanism and permanent organizing committee of mm. uh, the particular dialogue. The NGO network will facilitate sharing of information and understanding among peoples, which can take uh, forms in cooperation, seminars, and workshop. I guess what their idea of civil society is more towards you know, organizing events. It's very Mm. event-based, but it doesn't really touch into the structure of why um, uh, issues happen in the first place. So, I I would say it's, it's maybe... Maybe I'm just being cynical towards China, but I say it's, it's still very superficial on the mm-hmm. idea of what an NGO network would be between China and ASEAN. And probably still uh, very surface level as well, uh, but uh, they also said that this forum uh, is aimed at deepening mutual understanding and the friendship between China and Southeast Asian countries. And... Uh, also, they would like to facilitate people-to-people cooperation, promoting peace, uh, development and prosperity in East Asia. And I really, uh, I'm glad that they brought that up, promoting peace, uh, development and prosperity, because we have yet to solve the South China Sea issue with what uh, China involved with Vietnam and Philippines. Mm-hmm. And um, could uh, this move actually be in any way beneficial to us, uh, of giving us some ideas to solve? I think in... in uh, on a surface level, I think it would be great to have as a sort of um, a mutual understanding of friendship. <laughs> but on the deeper level, I I doubt that they would be able to somehow address or even uh, have a mutual understanding on shared issue or issue that will affect both region within the Asia Pacific region. On the other hand, that is plugging Southeast Asia. But especially on Singapore is ISIS. And uh, this is uh, kind of a scary uh, news, I would say, because it just sort of dies down for a while and then before you know it, someone else uh, is planning to fly to Syria, trying to join ISIS. And uh, Singapore is actually one of the countries that... Uh, is trying their hardest to curb this uh, issue and trying to reach out to people through education, through social media and all. But it looks like it's not very uh, effective because uh, we have two additional Singaporean youth who uh, have been arrested because they were trying to fly to Syria. You know what they need to have? They what? need to have their own chapter of GMM. <laughs> the whole movement of moderates, but I I do think that uh, in in Singapore because the racial um uh, it's a very multicultural society, uh it's also a very secular nation although they have some hints of uh, religious radicalization mm-hmm. not just you know, when it comes to uh, ISIS but also on the Christian side uh, there were news of uh, Christians movement against uh, gay rights uh, or against LGBT movements mm-hmm. especially the uh, the infam- uh, the the, fam- the the infamous incident of the wear white movement against the pink dot uh, in Singapore. But I, I do believe that uh, if Singapore really want to tackle this, they have to probably uh, look at this in the bigger picture and and, and make uh, ensure that the, Ma- the Malays or those that are involved don't feel like they are being marginalized mm-hmm. and they need to resort to radical organization for uh, redemption. And I think it's time for the leaders of these two countries to do something about it as well because uh, according to uh, the issue here, it seems that one of the guys, one of the students who were arrested, uh, his name is Arifil, and he said that he was planning to join ISIS in Syria and if he was unable to join ISIS, his plan was actually to carry out violent attacks in Singapore. And of course, we don't know what kind of violent attacks. It could be uh, bombing or uh, blowing himself up or what and it would definitely affect Malaysia because they are just right uh, below us and uh, this is something that 
I think should be urgently addressed by by Malaysia and Singapore together. Definitely. Anyway, that's uh, our show today when it comes to our ASEAN Daily. You can always listen to us via our podcast uh, in YouTube and also listen to us live right now at joinasen.com or on the go via your mobile uh, by downloading the Tune in app and search for Duran ASEAN. And also don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for all the daily updates on topics and speakers.